Hello there ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the video that will serve to largely answer the most common question that has flooded my inbox since posting the last video, and that question is, what do we do now? So, if you haven't watched that video, I'll put a link to it in the description, it's called How We Let America Die, and it talks about the failures of American conservatism and how they've allowed us to be basically in the situation that we're in, and what's going to happen if we don't do something about it. And it's probably the most important video that I've ever done, which I actually, I predicted that before I posted it, but this video is going to build off what was discussed in that video, so I'd recommend watching that first, but one thing that I didn't predict was the overwhelmingly positive response that that video received. I thought that the response would be pretty mixed, but it's almost all positive. And of course, you know, you're always going to have people who can never really get it, but that's to be expected. The point is, judging by the response of that video, I would say that there is reason to be optimistic about the future, and that is something that I have not been able to honestly say in quite some time. I mean, the average response that I got was basically, hey, John, that video changed my life. Thank you. Now, how do I fight? And so I've taken a few days to really think about that, and I'm here now to share with you my thoughts. So... Uh, we'll start with some general stuff, and then as we move along, we'll get more specific, so be sure to watch the whole thing. Watch all the way through. If you have to watch it in parts, that's fine. And again, all of this is said out of love, comes from a good place. I'm just trying to help. That's the disclaimer in case I get mad, but I don't think I will. But um, if you're looking for the video that's going to inspire you to want to take action, that's probably not this video. That's probably part one. This video is more of a guide of how to channel that energy and drive once it's already there. And I have to stress this because I think it's very important, and that is I'm not claiming to have the correct answers. These are not the answers. These are just my answers because I was asked about it. Um, this is not an organized movement. This is not my movement or something. You know, We can still all fight though, and, and know our role and do our part. And I have a plan for at least what I'm going to do. I have some ideas about what we can do as well. But basically, I think the best option would be for us to force the GOP to comply to the Make America Great Again, America First agenda by either brute force or by politically purging the party and replacing its members with people who are aligned with our interests. And then once that power exists, we would then use that to cripple the left in the universities, the media, loosen up the libel laws so they can't unjustly ruin people without consequence, things like that. And we'll elaborate on that as we continue. But let me again stress that I do not have the means of doing these things. I do not have nearly the power or the influence or the resources necessary, nor am I claiming that this is even the right move for us. I am simply sharing the answer to if we can take America back, what's the most likely way for us to do it? And that's what this is all about. And what you'll find out is basically that our problem isn't so much the left, it's the right and the people on the right who actually belong on the left. And there's no quick solution to this, you know. My answers might not be satiating to you if you were very inspired by that last video, but the reality of the situation is that we've got about 60 years of ground to make up for, and that starts one step at a time. But I will tell you right off the bat that really what we need is a new conservative manifesto. We need a new conservative manifesto for the Trump era and beyond. I myself have been outlining various parts of what that would look like, but I'm not married to the idea of it being written by me. That's for a few reasons. Firstly, because I'm not like ego invested in this. I don't feel like I have to be the guy that writes it just so I can take the credit for it. Because really, all that matters is that it's written by the right person. And I think I'd be a good person to do it because I think that I basically have my finger right on the pulse of this generation of conservatives and of the future of the movement. And that's not said in like a conceited way like, oh, you know, I'm the only one that understands these things. But I've read the comments. I've met you guys in person. You write me letters, etc. And for whatever reason, uh, that's basically what I've been told. And I think the reason for that is I'm a pretty transparent and relatable guy. My family doesn't have connections in politics or media. I didn't go to private schools. I had a pretty normal middle class, Midwestern upbringing. And because of that, I haven't been educated or pampered by the liberal elitist establishment to where I'm out of touch with the American people. And that's why I started doing this in the first place. I was listening to these commentators and these pundits, and I didn't think that they were spending enough time talking about the issues that really matter. And we'll talk about that more as we continue. But yeah, I didn't get into this because I thought that I'd have something to add to the socialism is bad dialogue, or that I had a new take on how centrally planned economies can be proven to be less efficient than market economies, both in theory and in practice. It's like, those issues are important, but what we're finding out is that people basically don't care. We might care. I, I mean, I've got those books on my shelf. I think they're quite interesting. But when I drive through my town and I see people out and about or in the pre-shutdown days where I'd be sitting in a coffee shop, people don't care about that. And why should they care? Our job is not to waste resources making people fluent in economic theory. People don't want that. People don't have time for that. If you look at the way the left operates, they basically just say whatever sounds good and they get people excited about that. And the conservative response is to scoff and say, well, how do you plan to pay for that? But it doesn't matter. People aren't voting for those policies because they've done the math and realized that they're solvent. They're voting for them because they want them to be true. Conservatives fail because we fail to recognize that people are for the most part not rational. We are much more influenced by emotions than we are by facts and logic. And we'll talk more about how to properly form arguments later. But the point is that 
The way to win isn't to compromise your ideas to make them more appealing. It's to change the language that you employ when selling those ideas. It's not about compromise, it's about rhetorical strategy. Our job is not to dismiss the concerns of the American people by telling them that, oh, well, our political opponent isn't gonna actually solve the problem for you. Our job is to solve the problem. And the way that we do that is by getting into power. And the way that we do that is by telling the American people that we are going to facilitate the best quality of life possible for them and for their families. Donald Trump is the best thing to happen to conservatism since Ronald Reagan, and he's actually even better and more conservative than Reagan was, excuse the heresy. But Donald Trump, here's a secret, literally doesn't know things. Donald Trump is not well versed in political theory or economic theory or foreign policy, yet Donald Trump could also beat an expert in any one of those fields in a public debate because what Donald Trump knows is far more important than those things which is people. Donald Trump understands people. And the public debate is not won by the person who is correct, but rather the person who the public perceives to be correct. So the point of this is to say that being correct, which we are, isn't enough to actually win. You can't just expect people to figure it out for themselves. You have to frame the issues in ways that appeal to people. And you yourself have to be appealing to people. You have to be high energy. This is the difference between Donald Trump and Jeb, Jeb Bush. Guac Bull Jeb, part of the Bush family, decades of experience in politics. He's out there low energy, begging people to clap as he recycles the same GOP platform. Oh, taxes should be lower. Guns are important. And then Donald Trump comes out there preaching that we're going to make America great again. A recognition of the discontent that many people feel about the direction in which their country has gone. We're going to stop letting other countries take advantage of us. A call for our trade deficits to be balanced out, for our trade policy to put the American people first so that other countries aren't getting rich at our expense. What was that? We're going to bring jobs back. A recognition that we've lost millions of jobs in the name of free trade, which is hollowed out in American towns all throughout the country. Our leaders are stupid. A recognition that people feel as though their leaders don't reflect their interests. Oh, and he also single-handedly destroyed Jeb Bush's campaign. And Jeb Bush, he just couldn't keep up with it. There's that clip of Jeb saying, well, you're never going to become president by insulting your way to the White House. And Trump goes back and he's like, well, let's see. I'm at 42 and you're at three. And, you know, he keeps going and Jeb is impotently trying to respond. Doesn't matter. He looks like he's about to cry. And Jeb was completely wrong because what Jeb Bush failed to recognize and what like a dozen other Republicans failed to recognize is that the politics of respect only work if the system deserves respect. And Donald Trump was the only man to understand and capitalize on the fact that the American people don't feel as though the system deserves respect because it has failed them. And that's because at his core, Donald Trump has always been a New Yorker and a man of the people. He doesn't talk like a politician. He doesn't pretend to be what he isn't. He is completely himself and he's quite the character, but none of that mattered because his election election represented to the American people a giant middle finger to an establishment that had failed them. And that's what this is all about. It's about taking our country back. But the other reason why I don't think I'm the best person to write this book is because as of right now, I don't have a big enough platform to to really make it like impactful. Uh, but I think that that actually works out well because a few years down the line when Trump is out of office, I'll hopefully have a much larger platform and presence within the national political conversation. And we'll need people there to continue the momentum of the movement after Trump uh, because the establishment GOP is gonna wanna return to business as usual. So if it lines up that way, then I'll write the book if no one has already written it. Um, and we'll, we'll have to time it correctly because we don't want it to just fizzle out. And that's why the name of this game is really patience and commitment. A lot of people want me to tell them ways for us to fix the country in the next five years, that's just not going to happen. The point of the book would be to clearly diagnose the problems in our country, and not by recycling the same BS talking points, but I mean like really and insightfully diagnose them. If you're familiar with my contents at all, you know what I'm talking about, um, and outline a pragmatic and appealing way forward that abandons the ideas that have led us here in the first place. And it sounds shallow when you talk about it, because almost all political books are basically redundant aggregations of the same talking points that we all know with some appeals to the founding fathers, general patriotism and some weird quasi self-help stuff. No one cares about that. If I thought that it would be anything less than groundbreaking, I would never do it. But it's something that we need because a book has a certain credibility to it that something like a video could just never have. Like videos can be widely distributed, shared, downloaded, whatever. But there's something about a book that is just much more serious and impactful. We need a concise, thorough manifesto from which to operate. Nothing else will provide all the information and the entire context. The point of the book is to appeal to politically oriented people and get them on our side. And judging by how effective that video was, I think it would be extremely effective. I mean, people were telling me that that video forced them to politically evolve. So we're not trying to publish this book to get everyone on our side. Such a book doesn't exist and can never exist, but we're trying to get everyone who probably would be on our side to join our side. And then we will use that influence and momentum as a relatively unified, true conservative movement to enact the change that we need to see by actually electing candidates who will bring about 
the true conservative America first agenda that Donald Trump spearheaded and basically exiling anyone who refuses to comply. And as we grow and gain momentum, it will be much harder for these never Trump conservatives uh, to keep a seat at the table, both politicians and pundits. These never Trump pundits who are still making money off the excitement that Donald Trump has brought to American conservatism. They will eventually lose relevance as the paradigm of conservative discourse in this country returns to where it should be. And so as you can see, there is no overnight solution to this. So I'm going to answer your questions of what you personally can do to help the movement and to help the cause. And none of this is going to be easy. Something that I say quite often in my videos is that we're all going to have to be comfortable making sacrifices because previous generations basically failed to do so, which is why we're in the position that we're in. And it kind of sucks. Kind of sucks. We're going to have to make those sacrifices. But in a different sense, there's actually something very noble about it. So the first thing that I want to share with you is a story to kind of frame how we should be thinking about it. And it's from the movie Zulu, which is an old 60s movie based on the conflict between the colonial British and the Zulus in Africa. And this battle in particular it was the Battle of Rourke's Drift in 1879. And basically, the British had suffered major losses, so they were left defending this very small area with less than 150 guys, and about a quarter of them were wounded or disabled, and they were about to go up against like 4,500 Zulu warriors, and they actually end up winning this battle against all odds, but... There's a scene in the film adaptation where someone's calling them a fool and, and yelling at them and telling, oh, you're all about to die. And one of the younger soldiers says to his superior, well, he's right. Why us? Why does it have to be us? And the guy turns back to him and he says, because we're here, lad, and nobody else, just us. And that is 100% the mentality that we have to have because we can complain. Oh, well, this isn't fair. It's too late. We'll never win. Why do I have to do anything about it? It's not fair. Bottom line is that you're here and we're here too. And we know what's wrong and we know what has to be done about it. And that's it. Nobody else is here. The average person is not here, but you are. And if you'd rather sit by and watch your country die, that's fine. But you will die knowing that you did nothing about it. And your children and your grandchildren will never forgive you. If there's one motif throughout the history of the world, it would be that men will make, without hesitation, tremendous sacrifices for their families and for their country. This is nothing new. Our culture wants you to believe that this is an expired necessity of what it means to be a man, but that's only because they're scared. Strong men built this country, and if there is anyone that could take it back, it would be strong men. That's why they want you to be feminine. That's why they bully you for masculinity. That's why they put you on medication for talking too much in elementary school. And I don't mean to alienate the women of the audience, but statistically speaking, this audience is about 93% male, and I fundamentally believe it is the duty of men to act, and quite frankly, I also believe that a lot of the reason that women are feeling compelled to step up to the plate right now uh, in the first place is because men have failed so spectacularly in this country. But of course, there are ways for everyone to get involved, but to all the young men out there watching who don't really feel as though they have an idea of what they want to do with their lives or what their purpose is, let me ask you this. What greater purpose could you possibly have than helping fight to take your country back? And you might say serving God, and that's true. But God is on our side. God is definitely not with the people fighting for unrestricted abortion access and cross-sex hormones for children. And obviously, we're talking about a political battle right now. This is not a call to revolution, but... There's really not a substantial difference in the implications of either or in the consequences of either. And what that means is that we really should be viewing this as a war for our country with the operative difference being that our enemies are already here and they've been working against us for decades and they're winning. But something to keep in mind is that no political battle is truly ever won or lost. It's just a matter of momentum and power. And what that means is that the time to act is now and it's not too late, but we better get going because the window is only going to shrink further from here. And these are not the answers. These are just my answers. Again, it's a lot of good and brilliant people working on this, many of them behind the scenes, but I was asked to give my take on it, so I will. And I'm not going to tell you everything that's planned because obviously we don't want to tell the enemy what our plan is. We don't want to put that out there. But when the time comes, you will know uh, because, you know, if we announce the plans before we can act on them, which we can't right now for the most part, they'll be prepared to defend against them and then it'll go to waste. These are things that would be discussed in the book uh, when, when the time comes or even behind the scenes because the masses don't need to know. The masses don't need to know everything. And that's not because they're not smart enough or good enough to be in the know. It's just because it's impossible to operate effectively if you have to keep tens of millions of people in the loop with everything that you're doing. And the whole point of the book would be to force the hands of our elected officials and have them either submit to us or be replaced by those in alignment with our agenda. And if it were done correctly, promoted by the biggest names in media and politics who agree with us, advertise correctly, etc., I think that's what it would do. All we would really have to do is facilitate what's best for the family, which on the macro scale then facilitates what's best for the society. And that's how we win. People are much less concerned with these petty appeals to different interest groups uh, because by the end of the day, or at the end of the day, we all have, or very likely will have, families to provide for. And no one is seriously making an appeal to that. Not on the right, because we're basically stupid for reasons I've already gone over. And not on the left, because the left doesn't care about the family unit. They actually would like to abolish it, because 
They want the government to be the absolute power in society. Marx wrote about this. They still write about this today. And also, to assert something like the family as good would mean that they are asserting something as objectively true, which would necessarily exclude people. And they're not looking to do that. I mean, the family in itself is also an acknowledgement of biological roles, uh, which the left rejects, which is why typically when you hear their versions of positions that are supposed to appeal to the family, they're mainly going over how rich people are bad, what? healthcare companies are bad, capitalism is bad. They're very willing to say that these things are bad. They're much less willing to say the truth, which is that the family in itself is good and it ought to be preserved uh, and the society ought to be oriented towards whatever gives it the best chance of prosperity. We win by appealing to the independence in middle America and the strategy is not to do that by compromising our beliefs, but by focusing on the issues that actually matter. And that would be an economy that increases the real income of the American family and prioritizes the American family over illegal aliens and foreign workers, an immigration policy that totally secures the borders and puts the American workers first, and a healthcare system that prevents the healthcare lobby from exploiting American families through predatory pricing and colluding with the government to profit off their illness and misfortune, etc. You could go down the whole line like that. Who would not vote for that person? That is how you win in a landslide. No one wants to hear from some establishment GOP figure saying, no, you're wrong to be upset about the cost of your health care. And if you listen to the left, who's promising to lower the cost, it's actually just going to increase the cost. Yeah, well, what do they care? You're not actually addressing the issue. You're just defaulting to the capitalism equals good talking points without actually providing a solution. And that solution isn't Medicare for all, but you're not leaving them with any other choice, probably because you're bought and paid for by the health care lobby. This is how we win. This country has always been center right. That is the heart of the country. The only reason the Democrats have been able to shift so radically to the left is because we've imported so many people who will vote for them regardless. And that's why our window to turn this around is shrinking. Pretty soon, appealing to middle America will be obsolete. And then we'll really be screwed. So we have to act now. We have to act precisely and strategically and without remorse, total war. And it starts with you. So before we even start to talk about what people can do on the individual level, the most important thing is that you yourself are in the best possible condition to be involved in this. And I made a joke on Twitter about how we should make a propaganda poster with this slogan on it. And I'm seriously considering doing it because I think it's important. But it was, remember, a disciplined mind is an effective mind. And that's totally true. You'll never be able to optimize yourself if you have no discipline. You'll be distracted by girls or nicotine or alcohol or sugar. Whatever in your life uh, it is, you have to cut it out because you have to be disciplined. You have to have self-control. You have to master your basic impulse pulses and transcend them. There's nothing cool or helpful about being addicted to things. It makes you weaker. We need you to be as sharp as possible, which means you need to cut things out of your life that are making you dull. If you're watching porn, spending all day on the internet, playing video games, vaping, or smoking weed, eating junk food, speaking very bluntly, you are in no position to help us win the culture war. But you could be, and we want you to be. We need you to be big guy. We need you to be sharp. We need you to be strong. We need you to be in shape. Because even ignoring the known benefits of being in shape, like speaking purely from a political perspective, it has an impact on the public perception of your movement. If it's you against one of those fat, communist, neckbeard slobs, and you're there, and you're not like this hulking individual, but you know, you fill out your clothes nicely, or you're clean cut young man, you're much more attractive and presentable. And that will make you a much more confident and capable individual. There's actually, there's an association between physical fitness and conservative beliefs. And I've talked about this before in greater detail, but it can basically be summarized as much of what makes people gravitate towards liberalism or the left is insecurity. It's why they're afraid of free markets. It's why many of the men are very feminine. It's why they're so much more likely to have mental illnesses. This could be a whole video, but the point is that you need to get in shape. Not only mentally, but physically as well, because the two feed off each other in a positive way. And the other general piece of advice would be that everything you do, virtually everything that you do, should be a reflection of your values. And the reason for that is that it turns out that in order to restore the society to being a moral, virtuous people capable of self-governance, you actually have to have moral, virtuous people capable of self-governance in that society. And that starts with you, big guy. And that means that you should strive to be humble. You should strive to be kind. That doesn't mean you have to be nice. Those are two very different things. Um, but you should also strive to be uh, courageous and to be diligent and to be chaste and patient and charitable and to have temperance. And not coincidentally, true conservative values are basically just Christian values. And those are the values that built our country. And what you'll find is that by striving towards those values, you will create the best version of yourself that is possible. You will be a good person with total control to pursue what is good and what is meaningful, almost as if it's written on your heart or something, right? But it's especially important for us to do this because it helps us normalize ourselves and our beliefs within the culture. And the reason the left is so militant about shutting down our speech and demonizing us into silence is because they know that if they can ostracize our beliefs and our values from the mainstream dialogue, they can control the culture and control the narrative. And so everything that you do should be a reflection of your values because that is the foundation of not only being a good person, but also fighting back against that successfully.
And the other important thing is that if we're trying to establish a stable country of moral people with a strong social fabric, then you yourself actually have to participate in that, which means you should set aside time every month, get involved with your community, go outside, get involved with your church, go to church, volunteer, help out your neighbors. You can attend events. There's no like one way to go uh, to go about it, but what you'll find is that the people who you'll meet doing that are the people who are going to be the most aligned with you in the community anyways, or at least that's been my experience. I don't really enjoy doing this because it's actually very challenging for me to function in normal society now. Like when you get to a certain level of political knowledge, I guess you just can't engage in like small talk anymore. And that's not like, oh, I know so many things. This conversation's beneath me. It's more like, why are you not concerned about this? Like, I don't care if you make your own shampoo from pumpkin seed oil, but it's okay. It's a good time. Okay, we're back. Um, I have a few more things I want to share before we break off into the direct action versus indirect action part. And the first one is that you have to stop apologizing. Stop apologizing. When the left insults you, they call you a racist or a sexist or whatever. The correct response is not, oh, really? How am I a racist? Because you're thinking to yourself like, oh, I know I'm not a racist. And now I get to beat them in a debate about whether I'm a racist. And it's like, maybe you're not a racist, but you're at least notably stupid. Because by responding like that, you have now dignified the insult. You have willingly put yourself on the defense. And the instant that you do that, you lose. So never apologize, never kneel, never respond to accusations like that with anything other than something to the effect of go F yourself. And then that's the end of the conversation. That's the only way that you win. If you engage in a debate about whether you're a racist, you lose. If you get into an insult match with them, you lose. Tell them to F off and walk away. After that, you have to stop being intimidated. Stop being intimidated by these people. These people are weak. They're mosquitoes. Stop keeping your head down whenever people speak poorly about President Trump. Stop allowing their voice to dominate the cultural narrative and stop pretending that you're doing it. Oh, I'm just trying to avoid conflict because that's just a rationalization. That's a cope. You're trying to rationalize your cowardice. Oh, never do. This is the worst. Never compromise on your beliefs to receive adulation from the left or, or so they just won't eat you or they'll eat you last. Never betray yourself and your values for people who would eat you otherwise. Speak up and even give yourself some wiggle room. Go about 10% more extreme than you actually are just to get the point across because every time you let a leftist or a liberal get away with saying something stupid, something that you know is wrong, bear in mind that someone might have heard that and think, oh yeah, that makes sense. That's how people get indoctrinated. They're told these things by their professors, by their celebrities, uh, these ideas are never challenged, so they just believe them to be true and they conform to them. We don't have the luxury of avoiding that conflict anymore. Previous generations spent a bit too much time getting high and listening to Led Zeppelin IV, so now we're going to have to make up for that. And the next one, very significant, you cannot be afraid to lose people. Don't be afraid to lose friends or even family members over this. And that doesn't mean that you should be the one to sever the ties like, oh, you don't agree with me? Bye. But it does mean that if you have people in your life who are willing to cut you off because of a political difference... Don't ever lower yourself and beg for them to stay in your life or, or lie about your beliefs so they continue to grace you with their presence. Never sell yourself out because no one in your life that would ever cut you off because of a political disagreement actually cared about you in the first place, ever. And that's a hard pill to swallow, but it's true. If they're willing to throw out the entire relationship because of something like that, you should be too because it was obviously worthless. The greatest decision I've ever made was to become outspokenly political. Like, sure, I made myself the most hated person at my high school, but I thrived on it because I know that I might not have as many friends anymore. Hashtag two friends gang. Um, but I have integrity. And that's the problem. People don't have integrity. That's why high school friendships don't last. You're afraid to deviate from the social norm. So no one really like knows who you are, what makes you different. And as a result, no one really cares about you. You're just like everybody else. So you're easily replaceable. It's not possible to care about someone who doesn't have integrity because if you care about someone with no integrity, integrity, the version of them that you care about isn't actually who they are. Therefore, you don't actually care about them. You care about the version of themselves that they have displayed. If you are afraid to lose friends or family members over political differences, ask yourself, how close were you actually with that person? Is someone who would put your relationship on the line over a political dispute really worth keeping in your life? That's the thing though, because every argument with them is reduced to morality. So it isn't in their view that you just disagree on policy, it's that you've proven yourself to be morally reprehensible, and because of that, they probably want you to be hanged, drawn, and quartered. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, I don't want to start any trouble. Well, you know, I, I just don't want to cause any problems. You know what you're doing? You're disguising your cowardice as a virtue to minimize your anxiety. Don't do that. If they're spewing their opinions, you're entitled to chime in. And if that's a problem, then it's their fault and not yours. Don't let them use emotional leverage. You deserve people in your life who care about you for who you are. And that aside, let's not pretend that they're the ones with morality on their side. And the last thing that's important in general is that you're educating yourself. You're listening to commentators and keeping up with the news. But most importantly, in my opinion, is that you're reading books. This is extremely important. And it's why I have a list of book recommendations on my website. 
That gets updated with four new books every two weeks, and it's not just the conservative classics or whatever. I mean, some of them are pretty broad and surface level, but you know they get pretty specific and esoteric too. I just kind of pick from my library, which is really just an archipelago of piles on the floor. But that aside, it's of great importance, and if you think you don't have time to read, chances are you're lying to yourself. I mean, think about how much time you spend on your phone every day or watching TV, etc. You have time to read. You can manage a chapter a day. And a lot of what intimidates people about reading is just that it requires focus, and our attention spans have been so diluted by technology that it's difficult for people to like really sit still and focus on something like a book. But there are more interesting and brilliant books out there than you'll ever be able to read. You will die knowing that there are things that you never got to know about. So get to it because uh, once you get into the habit of it, it's actually pretty fun. And it makes you a more interesting person. Most people have nothing insightful to say about anything. You can separate yourself from them by reading books. And I'm not talking about like the the mainstream books that you'll find at Target or the airport, those are basically for people who want to feel educated and insightful. Those are garbage, very little in my archipelago uh, or on my website could ever be purchased at either of those locations because I'm above that. And you are too, so act like it. Now, speaking of acting, this is where we get into the indirect versus direct action. The whole point of everything that was just discussed is to prepare you for either uh, and make you, you know, an asset to the movement. So now we'll talk about things you can actually do to be indirectly involved and or directly involved. And everyone should be involved in some capacity. You can pick which ways, but we'll start with the indirect because it's easier. So basically, indirect action, in my opinion, basically means that you're helping in the fight without actually being at the center of it. The benefits of this are that you can live your life as you normally would. You don't have to worry about getting doxxed. You don't have to worry about getting killed. Uh, and you're still helping people who are directly involved by supplying them with resources. Remember how we talked about this being kind of like a war? That's what those who are indirectly involved do. They supply resources to those directly involved so that they can continue to directly work towards advancing our interests as a cohesive movement. Everyone with a role to play, none inherently better than the other, with the common goal in mind. Everyone does their job. And it sounds off-putting, but the best and easiest thing that you can do is just give money because money is just value. It's no different than if you coded your city in posters with slogans that support our agenda. And if that's not something that you're able to do, like, no worries. You can help by enabling people like that to take action. And the people that do this are just as important, if not more important, than the people that are directly involved because they make it all possible. Like with me, for example, do you think I could ever get a normal job at this point? People are getting fired for simply questioning the Black Lives Matter narrative. And I've spent the last two years speaking out against that narrative with my face, my name online, others like it, tearing it to shreds. Because that's what I do. That's what I provide. I make videos. They've been seen millions of times. I promote our views online. I show people that they're perfectly normal and rational and common. And I get messages from people every day saying that I've changed their mind on something or other. And in turn, I get death threats. I'm constantly harassed. I can never get a normal job again. I've been cut off by friends and a couple family members. But it's okay because that's my job. That's what I do. And I couldn't do it without you supporting me. I do this so that the guy working at a job he wants to keep, who will get fired if he speaks, his mind doesn't have to. And in turn, that guy throws me four bucks a month. It's mutually beneficial. One side cannot exist without the other. If no one's on the front lines, we make no progress. But if no one is helping those guys on the front lines, then we make no progress. Everyone has a role to play. Everyone does their job. And like I said earlier, this isn't necessarily an organized movement, but this is a movement that's building momentum. And so if you want to help build that momentum, I would recommend giving to, in no particular order, uh, Gun Owners of America, which is a gun lobby that actually does what the NRA pretends to do. Family Research Council, which is an organization that works towards the interests of American families and also the values that we mentioned earlier. Uh, there's the American Family Association, which basically does the same thing. National Right to Life as well. Uh, then for immigration, there's FAIR, CIS, and Numbers USA. Judicial Watch does good work. And I'd also say it's important to, su uh, to support those working in independent media. Because like I said, we can't do this without you, which means you should get a Heck Off Commie membership at heckoffcommie.com. And I'm actually, I'm adding something this month that's going to basically be like a Zoom lottery where I'll pick 10 random people every month and we'll do a big Zoom call, talk about politics, strategy, news, whatever. That's going to be fun. Plus you get a bunch of other stuff and it's vitally important and also relatively inexpensive. But if that's not enough and you'd like to get directly involved, you can do a few different things depending on how involved you'd like to be. You can go into politics as a career. There's not necessarily an ideal job to have or to shoot for. Really what matters is that you're there and you're set in your beliefs and you have integrity and you're ready to be effective. But if you don't want to do that, and this is going to sound very basic, but it can be effective, you can do things like write letters. And I don't mean like write some BS letter, you know, I'm mad about this. I mean, like you write a well thought out letter, you get as many people as you can to sign it, and then you send it to me or someone else with a platform, and then we'll get people to sign it, and then you send it. Or you go hang signs uh, on freeway overpasses that spread our message. And if you're going to do it, do it properly. Like, same thing with the letters. Like, if you're going to do it, make nice signs. Go get them printed at a print shop. They'll be more expensive, but it's worth it. And place them strategically. And don't make the designs too complicated. Under a sentence and to the point. You know, something like, American families over illegal aliens. Or porn is damaging our children. Or even uh, a disciplined mind is an effective mind. Just anything like that. And I'm not responsible for anything that you choose to do, by the way. I'm just brainstorming. What do I know? But the point is that, 
even if people aren't going to like instantly change their mind when they see it, the point is it will allow people who agree with us or basically agree to see that their views are being represented in public and being promoted in the culture and it will raise their morale. And it's also important because it's going to show the enemy that we're fighting back. It shows them that we're speaking out still. We're not afraid. And also start attending their events. Don't go to shut them down, but go to bully the dog shit out of them during the Q&A. Make them afraid to speak, not because you'll shut them down, but because you'll humiliate them in front of everyone because you'll be prepared with your arguments and your counter arguments and you'll record it and it'll spread across social media, make them afraid to spread their ideas, not by threatening them or becoming violent, but by exposing them. Also, a note on arguments in general, there's nothing wrong with choosing to use emotional arguments because they work and because they're actually more effective than factual arguments. The average person does not care about facts and logic. What's wrong is using them as a crutch because you don't have a factual or a logical argument, which is what the left does. It's still all about framing. No one's going to care or respond well to you coming out saying, well, statistically speaking, 95% of mass shootings are committed in gun-free zones. You instead need to get in their face like, you don't care that single mothers living in dangerous neighborhoods should have a right to protect themselves and their children? What the hell is wrong with you? You know, and then you can get into the facts and the logic, but you have to utilize framing to convey emotion and morality, which luckily is on our side, uh, because otherwise you just sound like a robot and you'll lose. We want to use facts and logic to assist our morality and our regard for the American people, not just use them for the sake of dunking on libtards and viral videos. It's the same thing we were talking about earlier. You get up and you sincerely say, we're going to make a college education affordable because no American should have to be tens of thousands of dollars in debt to get an education. And we're going to do that by cutting federal student loan subsidies. It's about framing. If you come out strong, you get people excited. By the time the left is like, but but they can't cut the subsidies. First of all, yes, we can and we're going to. But by that point, it won't even matter. Because like we said, people want it to be true. And once you've sold them, it's going to be very difficult to convince them otherwise. And does this type of strategy mean that we're going to win over every Bernie Sanders supporter or every liberal? No. But it does mean that a lot of independents who gravitate towards the left because they present answers to the issues that Republicans fail to address, even if the answers are dumb, it means that they might be inclined to see things our way. They don't need to know the ins and outs of every policy. They just need to know that our heart is in the right place and that we're going to do whatever is in our power to look out for their best interest, which is all true. And framing the issues is very important and making sure that we're focusing on the most important ones first because they're all sort of connected. For example, we're never going to be able to return to fiscal responsibility unless we cut entitlement spending. But no party would dare try to significantly cut entitlements since so many people are dependent on them. So before we do that, we have to raise people's standards of living so they're not as dependent on them, if at all, anymore. Uh, it's like, okay, so how do we do that? Well, we have to create jobs and we have to raise wages. How do we do that? We implement America first trade policies and immigration policies. We cut regulations that cripple small businesses, etc. All with the proper framing, it really is that simple. The problem is no one ever becomes rich in politics by working in the best interest of the American people. People, which is why we also have to completely destroy the relationship between big business and government. I mean, why do you think so many small businesses were ordered to remain closed during the shutdown, many of which went out of business, but Walmart was considered essential? That's just one example. But businesses don't care about you. They care about their best interest. And sometimes that means providing to you goods and services at a fair competitive price. But other times that means buying off the government so that their competition is completely destroyed. And now you have no choice but to patronize them. But back to how people can help. It sort of builds off what we said earlier about how everything you do should reflect your values. We need conservatives in media and Hollywood and the education system. A lot of times conservatives are like art. That's silly. Art is for girls. Art defines culture. We need conservatives to start putting it out there. I don't know how, which is likely why I'm not an artist, but it doesn't have to be explicit. It just has to be like present. I was working on writing a screenplay with one of my friends because we're pretty funny, uh, pretty funny creative guys. And, you know, who knows, maybe we could sell it. But in that screenplay, there were very subtle endorsements of our values and of our beliefs. And that's exactly what we need. Like, not exactly that, but you get the idea. You can't win the culture war if you're not participating in the culture. And that doesn't mean participate in the negative parts of the culture just to say that you're participating. It means that you should participate in shaping the direction of the culture towards something that's aligned with our values. And it's very important that we start to do this. We start to do it now. Like the moment that you're done watching this video, start to think about what your role is going to be. Because here's what's going to happen if we don't. Trump will leave office. All of the never Trump conservatives are going to publish articles declaring Trumpism to be dead. The GOP is going to prop up establishment candidates who talk about restoring true conservatism which means restoring conservatism that got us here in the first place, which is basically an occasional tax cut and giving amnesty to millions and millions of illegal aliens. And we need to let them know that we're not going to allow that to happen. We're embracing a true, authentic conservative movement. And if they don't support it, then we will vote them out or leave them behind. Join or die. Because Donald Trump is our last chance. When you come at the king, you best not miss. And what that means is that since we've upset the left and the entire Washington establishment and the elites and big business by electing Donald Trump, if Donald Trump can't seriously make changes or at least get us on the right track, then when he he's gone, the pendulum is going to swing hard in the other direction. So hard, we're not even going to know what hit us. From that point, I don't know what we're going to do. I mean, why do you think they hate Donald Trump? Why him? 
of all people. Why does the left hate him more than anyone? And why does the Republican establishment still dislike and try to subvert Donald Trump? Why? It's because he's actually conservative. It's because he actually has our interests at heart. And that threatens the established power in this country. And they don't like that. They would much rather have you believe that your choices are between the radical left and the increasingly liberal Republican Party. But it doesn't have to be that way. We can still take the reins back. Donald Trump won because he appeals to middle America. The average American isn't too concerned about politics or ideology. I mean, like 60 million of them don't even care to vote. But we can still win. And when we win, we're going to use our power and our influence to crush the left. We are going to cripple the media. We are going to cripple the universities. And that doesn't mean, oh, we're going to get the government to shut them down. It just means that we're going to enforce laws that already exist, and we're going to revoke special privileges and stop propping them up, and the destruction of our country as a result. We're going to bring American education back to education that's actually American. We're going to destroy their ability to brainwash our kids, and we're going to start playing like we want to win. How do we take the country back? I don't know. Without asking nicely, probably. But like we said, this doesn't happen overnight. If we can force the hand of the GOP and actually elect people who are conservative, if we, if we can like organize and get people to vote against incumbent fake conservatives in favor of actual conservatives, then things can actually be accomplished. That's our problem. Our problem isn't the left. Our problem is the right and the people on the right pretending that they belong there. And this might seem like an impossible task. Maybe it seems impossible. I don't know. But ultimately, it's up to you. Like, all significant change throughout history. It starts with individuals and then groups and then masses, etc. We are in a war for the future of our country and you can either join us or you can do nothing, which means that you've chosen to join them in your apathy or laziness. And maybe we lose, but I would much rather personally spend my life fighting for something that matters and losing uh, than I would allowing something that matters to just die in front of me while I focus on things that are less important because I've convinced myself that there was no chance anyway. So starts with you. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around to the end of the video. Another long one, but hope you got an idea of how you can help in the fight to take our country back. And you know, one thing you could do, or a few things you could do that's broadly speaking, one big umbrella of things, well, you could leave a like on the video. You could subscribe to the channel. You could share the video with your friends. You could leave a comment with your thoughts. And you can turn on post notifications. That would get us like 60% of the way there. 100% is we take our country back. Doing those things is like 60%. I've done the math. I've stayed up. I've run the numbers. I can send them to you later if you would like. Anyways, thank you so much for watching and may God bless America.